So I realized after a while, I'm scandalizing a few people. I didn't think I was. Mm -hmm. And then, um, is this recording? Yeah. Uh, okay. well, I mean, this might be a story before this. You, you can put this in, patch it in, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anymore. But, um, so someone was tallying the number of times I cussed in class. And I don't even know who, the word gave back to me that she was doing this. I don't even know who it was or what she, but, and then she, like, told someone I'd used the F word, like, I can't remember, six times in one class, mm -hmm. which is absolutely, like, yeah, yeah, like a lot for, and, and so, like, she was inflating her tallies. <laughs> and so she was hearing it when I, even when I wasn't saying it, I realized that. I was like, and then I started to get um, a few complaints from students that, one of them in the student for the student evaluation, she wrote something like um, she quoted the verse from James about um, how can pure water come from an unclean source? <laughs> like you're partying the time, mm -hmm. which um, I don't think that's what Saint James is talking about. But anyway, it was um, I thought I'm scandalizing people. I don't want to do that. So I try not to as much as I used to mm -hmm. in class, but, uh, there. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like any other word where it can have, it just, because we've all looked at them so much, they have a different level of power, right, when we use them in speech. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, like, strategically, it can be beneficial when used in the right way. Well, because it stresses. Right. Uh, Words are for communication. And so, yeah, we need to think about how we use our words. Mm -hmm. We use all, but like cuss words are not a special case. I think the worst things, the most dirty things that are ever said to one another don't involve cuss words. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, things like I hate you or, you know, you're so ugly. Did you hear what Austin was doing? You know, this sort of thing. Those are the things that, um, especially the gossip. Those are the yeah. things that harm people. Yeah. And cursing them out. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you can, it can, can be. Yeah, it can be. It can be. It can, but, but, yeah. Just the word in and of itself. The whole, this is not something that comes from the Bible. Um, the Bible actually has cuss words in it. Like, if you want to. Mm -hmm. So, um, in the Hebrew, for sure, I would say, arguably, even in the, the Greek New Testament, but the Hebrew, for sure, there's a, a couple places that uses uh, these two words, hara, the shahim, it's shit and piss. And um, it's in the text, but there's a little note saying, if you're reading it in the synagogue, you're supposed to use, like, uh, for, for shahim, uh, piss. You're supposed to say Meira blind foot water. <laughs> <laughs> and for uh I'm trying to remember what is for Tara for shit. Anyway. But uh no. you, <laughs> there's another there's another word like dirt or something that you're supposed to use instead. Uh when you're reading it in the synagogue, just because mm -hmm. it's a holy place and so like it is considered to be too um like profane, yeah. not in the sense of like it's sinful to say it, mm -hmm. but if in, in the presence of God, it's inappropriate yeah. to use this sort of language, is the idea. Mm -hmm. um, so that this, this idea of like profane, like profanity, so that, that's the thing is like the opposite of holy is common, profane. Uh, it doesn't mean it's dirty, it just means it's common. Mm -hmm. yeah. So and is that where the Probably the idea of the stipulation of you shouldn't use uh, curse words came, and that some people from Judaism it as yeah. sinful. No, well, I'm not saying just from uh, Judaism, but from just the idea that it's oh. profane or something. So I don't know who's going to watch this. Um, I'm going to throw my friend Bill Bonner under the bus here. Have you met Bill? Do you know who Bill is? So, uh, Bo, my friend, has a theory that 
for English speakers at least. It's the same thing in Israel. Mm -hmm. Like there's no such thing in modern Hebrew as a cuss word. Mm -hmm. Like it just isn't. Um, I know in Spanish there is, but so it just it's kind of culture to culture. Right? Mm -hmm. um, his theory for English is that all of our cuss words are the old English words. So so in German, Scheitze is not a cuss word. But shit is. Because then the, uh, the French came and we get like, um, you know, they're using, I don't know, triple cut or something, I don't know, but they're, they're using a uh, Latin word or a Gaulish word. And so during the Norman conquest, it was common to uh, use Old English root words. And so we started using all these other ones, especially for bodily activities. Uh, no fuck. So um, you start using it. that's an old English word. It's like goes way back to the beginning of the Anglo Saxons in England. And uh, it's it's not dirty. I mean, obviously it's talking about sexual activity, but um, Talk, have conversations about that all the time and no one's scandalized. Yeah. As long as you don't use that word. But it's because it, it comes from an mm -hmm. old English past. I think Phil has a point about that. Anyway, I'm just We're talking about the Watchmen. Yes. Yeah, so but there are some cuss words in there, but there aren't really that many. I, I have to say, I think the movie had more probably the uh, movie. foul language out of than the novel does. Yeah. Um, I didn't even catch on that. But, uh, all right, well, we'll, we'll introduce uh, sure. where, where it is. So, uh, well, thank you for listening to our uh, pre-talk. It's <laughs> a pre-game show. <laughs> Talking about cuss words. <laughs> the art of cursing. <laughs> All right, okay. So, welcome back to the World Needs a Little Talk. Again, I'm Austin, and this is... Dr. Umbarger. Matthew Umbarger. And uh, so... You can call me Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Today, we'll be looking at... Uh, the Watchmen. Actually, just for today, half of the novel, me yeah. and him have both that you ended up getting through chapter six. I've read the first six chapters. Okay, yeah. yeah. So we both got through chapter six, and that's about halfway through the novel. Mm -hmm. And, well, a lot has happened. Um, where do we start? Um, so this was, like, this is widely regarded as the best graphic novel mm -hmm. ever written. Is what I've heard, um, and I know a few people who, but at least put it in like the top three. I think Dr. Dietrich, uh, my colleague, I think he considers it to be like one of the top, certainly top ten. But I think yeah, he puts I, it in the top three. Mm -hmm. um, so it was published in 1985 through 88. Is that right? I think something like that. Uh, so mid 80s. Uh, I have to say, it has, as someone who grew up in the 80s. That it has that kind of 80s stink to it. Um, so, it, um, yeah, it, 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 I had never read this. I'd seen the film version. Who made that film? That's right. Uh, we've both had seen the film version before that Zack Snyder did. Zack Snyder. For yeah. DC. Who, if, do you know much about Zack Snyder? I know he makes movies. Okay. Uh, he well, makes he DC, did. he didn't. He did make DC movies. So okay. his big I movies see. before doing Watchmen were 300. Yes, 300 I've, I've seen Empire. 300. And then uh, he's done other stuff as well. Those are the more prominent ones that I have seen. But then he got to, to tackle the beginning of the DC right. EU, in which he had Superman, Batman v Superman, and then started doing Justice League, lost his daughter, right. the studio screwed him over, Came back years later, made his own version. So the Snyder Which Cut. Is, the Snyder Cut is critically acclaimed. I've heard. I've not mm -hmm. seen any of these. I think the one DC film I've seen is Wonder Woman. Wow. The so first you're, one. You're I'm a DC film illiterate. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Uh, you know, growing up, I knew DC a lot more than Marvel comics. I think my so most of my exposure to comic books growing up, this will tie in with things later we have to talk about, 
was um, I would go to my grandma and grandpa's house in Arlington, Kansas, and my uh, two youngest uncles, maternal uncles, were still living in their house. And they were, um, when I was born, I think they were like maybe seven or eight, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and a little older than that. I think Uncle Clifford's about 10 years older than me. He was probably 10, and Jonathan's a little older. Anyway, so they were living in the house when I was a little kid. Yeah. And it was always a lot of fun because they had you know, big, like big kid toys and comic books. And we didn't have comic My My mom was not that big on comic books. Mm -hmm. And um, I would just spend hours reading the comic books. And um, and they, they had a lot of the old stuff too because uh, my uncle Bob had left a lot of things mm -hmm. in their house when he left. Mm -hmm. So they had all his old comic books from like the late 60s through the 70s. So um, that was great fun. So all my exposure, I can remember lots and lots of Batman and Superman. Superman was always my favorite. Of course, that was the, the era of the Christopher Reeves uh, Superman films. Mm -hmm. um, so I um, was a huge Superman fan when I was a little kid. Um, but yeah, in recent years, I know the MCU a lot better than the DCEU. Yeah, that, the, well, that's a, there's, that, I mean, that's almost a whole other conversation topic, yeah. but just so, Zack what? Snyder, after they decided no longer to go with his vision, you know, DC had some in-house fighting, the old guy left, James Gunn now took over his head, yeah, yeah, I've heard all that. and they're going to reboot the whole cinematic franchise again. So now it's known as the DCU, is now what they're calling it. And they're starting somewhat from scratch. They, they're they kind of keeping what they want from what's been established and getting rid of everything Are they going to do like a crisis on Infinite Earths thing to reset The way they're something? resetting it is with Flashpoint. Okay. If, if you're familiar yeah. with that storyline. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, so that's how they're resetting. Okay. But, um... First they have to release the Flash without yeah. any legal problems. June 16th. Oh, it is coming up? Yeah. I'm okay. sure they got something worked out there. And I, I know we're both thinking about Ezra Miller. Yeah. So. A little bit. I mean, so, so uh, anyway, so the Zack Snyder thing is actually relevant because one of the things I know about um, those films, even though I haven't seen them, is people were commenting on how dark and grim they were mm -hmm. compared to, well, like the old Superman films. Um, that I grew up with. Uh, which, I mean, there's some serious stuff in there. Yeah. Lois Lane dies in the first film and Superman has to resurrect her. Yeah. Yeah. Spitting the yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's why, that is why I bring it up, is because, well, DC in my time has always been considered the darker side of comics compared oh. to Marvel. And yeah, when I was a kid, it was not like that. But in my time, it always had. Uh -huh. And. Um, I would argue comic book side, that's not necessarily true. Both comics have their elements of humor and their elements of like uh, drama. Like I feel like comic side for the most part, it's pretty the same. But what I will say is film wise, we talked about this a little bit the other day, that MCU kind of come up with this cookie cutter formula where it's Let's make a comedy following this superhero where they save the day. Then. And that's... Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's pretty much what every movie is. And uh, I just saw uh, Doctor Strange and then Multiverse of Madness. And that was certainly more for... Yeah. Uh, tamed. But mm -hmm. it's still... It has a lot of comedic notes. Yeah. Still. Still. There's a lightheartedness. Mm -hmm. It's fun. I think that's the thing. Okay. So the, this is not fun. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know. Maybe some people do think that this is not fun for me to read. Mm -hmm. um, there is no levity in this whatsoever. And uh, so that whole like grim dark thing, I don't know. I'm sure it was there in the world before this, but I, I wonder if this is why this 
got so much attention because um, this is not your typical superhero Superman comic from I mean, like the early eight, think about this uh, I think uh, Superman three with Richard Pryor okay you start, have you seen Superman three probably a lot yeah you don't need to see it I mean, it's, <laughs> it's not it kind of has I have a nostalgic. It is not a good movie. I watched it a while back. And I was disappointed. It was one of those, but when I was a kid, I loved that film. Um, and it has Richard Pryor in it. So there's a good, you know, you know what kind of film it is. Mm -hmm. uh, it starts off with a big slapstick sequence. Um, and it's just silly, really. Um, so that came out in like 1980. Um, so this is a big change of tone for comic books. Yeah. Well, Man of Steel, Zack Snyder's uh -huh. Superman he did, is, well, it's definitely my favorite Superman film. And it, excluding the Dark Knight trilogy, because of course that is top tier filmmaking, Zack Snyder's Superman would be probably my favorite DC really? film. And I haven't seen it, huh? Yeah, I've well, seen the Dark Knight trilogy and I love it. Man of Steel, well, totally it's pretty similar to the Dark Knight trilogy. There's not a lot of heat. Okay. Which he, Christopher Nolan wrote it because they were originally going to have him do it, and then he gave it to Snyder. He wrote the Man, Man of Steel? Steel? Oh, interesting. Yeah, so then the whole time, you know, you're not hitting any of those <coughs> comedic elements, you're following the story of which is done in a very impactful way. This alien is, you know, on Earth trying to figure out who he is and what purpose he could have. We, we, we were in the same conversation, wearing different clothes. Yeah, we had a, <laughs> like a costume change. Mm -hmm. So I, was, <laughs> I look nicer today. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So, uh, well, I'll start with a welcome back uh, midway through what you'll be listening and or watching as uh, we had technical difficulties mm. last week and ended up losing the majority of our recording. So you'll f have to find one of those little like the from the old television, like when the broadcasting got interrupted. The fuzz, just the yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then like <laughs> technical difficulties, please stand by. And the, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Then have us back. <laughs> You'll look mostly the same. You typically dress about the same. I yeah, think. it's a different. I think it's a different color. Yeah, I was gonna say it's a different type. color. But, but, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I have a look. Yeah, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure last week I was in. You were in pink. Yeah, it was pink uh, sweatpants, and then I think I had fingerless gloves on. I looked you probably, did. Probably looked like a completely different person. You look like, um, well, like one of the punks in this. <laughs> one, of, like, <laughs> one of the thugs that Rorschach would have handled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, so I've like learned. Like the first Street Fighter or something. <laughs> yeah. What it was was I wanted to be a superhero, too. Or I should say, uh, what do they call it, Manessa Adventurer? Costumed costume adventure. Costume adventure. Yeah, we don't That's have what superpowers. they call them in there. When I was a little kid, I wanted to be a superhero when I grew up. I was like, people said, what are you going to be when you grow up? I said, superhero. When you were a kid, did you ever think you would just spontaneously have powers? I don't think... I, I fantasized about it, but I don't think I thought that was a possibility. I don't think did I you? ever truly believed in it, but there would be days where I just stand there and stare at my fists going hur, hur, hoping the claws would pop out and i Some was wolverine, wolverine. Yeah. yeah and then yeah. well after seeing the first uh, fantastic four movie with chris evans as human torch when he first was discovering it's it so you bad. know he'd always <laughs> just snap and then his thumb would come out like a lighter right i mean sometimes i do that and I'd... <laughs> but uh, i mean of course yeah. the main thing was thinking you could use the force Mm hmm Oh, yeah, I, I do remember trying some of that. Yeah. Um, well, it was yesterday, right? You were staring at the coffee mug, right. hoping it'd come over <laughs> to you. <laughs> That'd be awesome. But, yeah. Um, so, what are we going to start with? So, I'm trying to remember what we yeah, yeah, want so to talk about. I, where we left off was we were talking about uh, Snyder, who, was, who did the yeah. film adaptation, uh -huh. which was very accurate. 
to yeah, it's exactly. almost blow for blow. Not all. Doesn't have everything in the graphic novel. If am I going to recommend this book? Are you going to recommend this book? It's certainly worth um, from an artistic, like technical uh -huh. artistic. And I think we already said this. Mm -hmm. I can't read anyway. From a technical artistic aspect, it is worth looking at. Um, yeah. The storytelling so, is done in a very brilliant way. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we caught this part, but I'll, I'll do it faster. Sure. I showed an example of yeah, go ahead. a panel last time where we're seeing two different events happen at the same time, and we're only getting dialogue to one of them yeah. because that dialogue is being used to tell both events even mm -hmm. though you know completely dissociated that's just kind of like a, one of the artistic things that he's really good at throughout this novel because he does it i in about every uh one of the books he almost overdoes it in my opinion but that's okay yeah. it's still like he's really good at it also you have the comic book within the comic book that was the big that, one um yeah. that so you got this guy reading a comic book about this um guy stranded on an island and he's, it's all in monologue. He's talking to himself or describing what's going on. But the comic book, this guy's commentary, serves as commentary on the events mm, happening actual events. in the world around them. Okay. So that's um, really, really clever. Um, I think I said last week, it's like sometimes like a clever, too clever by half sometimes. Yeah. It's a, for my <laughs> taste, it's like. I see what you've done there. Yeah, I already saw you did that. <laughs> oh, you think you're smart with your <laughs> But no. Uh, uh, it is impressive, mm -hmm. no doubt about it. Well, and then uh, we talked a little bit about it's uh, so it's the fictional comic line about uh, pirate comics. Mm, yeah. And then uh, I think you brought it up. There's a, well, in between each actual chapter, there's uh, prose, and mm -hmm. it's different things sometimes it's about dr manhattan the beginning was a novel written from the perspective of the original night owl hollis and then there was a section that was like the history of the these pirate comic books yeah that's really interesting because it, it feels a little bit like um because it talks about how the the writer uh has this all this arrogance he's got mm -hmm. a huge like he's got a lot of hubris and he um he kind of um he's got also very he's very jealous of the artist who is mm -hmm. illustrating what he writes and kind of drives him away because of his arrogance and i wondered if there's a little bit of i don't know poking fun at himself mm -hmm. here yeah. by Al, alan moore who wrote mm -hmm. the book yeah so we yeah we, we talked about that maybe uh that was truly going on between him and Gobbins and <laughs> clearly not a lot because they still did it together. Well, but you know, yeah. Did they but, work uh, on anything else? You know, that's what I was wondering if they continued to be a duo at all. It says what they both worked on on the back, and I don't think so. I think this is the only thing mm. they did together. The art is, you know, we always think of this as Alan Moore's Watchmen. I think, mm -hmm. but I think this really belongs to Gibbons as much. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely. 50 50 because we talked a little bit like a lot of the times it's the artwork that's telling the story even. yes sometimes it's not even the dialogue that we're being yeah. given and little details i mean i think this is kind of weird to me because a lot of times reading a graphic novel goes quicker reading a comic book certainly doesn't take very long um it's not i don't think of it as engaging reading mm -hmm. it's just you know amusing reading this takes I think longer to read page per page than typical novels that you might read. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that way? I feel that way because in reading other comics you know it's still like oh look at the pictures but mm -hmm. it's not as this is just a lot more in depth like you really mm -hmm. look at panel by panel. And you have to look for the details uh -huh. and there have been a few times where I was tired or I was trying to read a bunch and I missed stuff and I have I find myself going back and looking yeah I had or, to do that when I was yeah this, uh, it was this weekend I was uh, reading ahead when we were I was coming back from Kansas City 
and uh, I started to nod off in the car and I ended up reading I think the same panel and it was one of the big ones that took up most mm. of the page. I ended up reading that panel like five times. I think. <laughs> right. And then I'd back up, and I, don't know, I finally got it. And I was like, I think I lost even more than I had there. Yeah. But uh, uh, Brendan poked his head uh, over. He's in the back seat. And uh, uh, one, uh, yeah, it was funny because me and you talked about how wonderful this artwork is. And I was on a few pages, and he was like, hey, do you find how bad that art is? Like, is it hard to get through the novel? And I was like, are you looking at the same book I am? Like this? <laughs> and he was like, and so then I actually started flipping through and showing him. I think it was this page I was on. And this page isn't bad, but I get like, this is one of the less exciting pages if you're not, sh oh, quick, yeah. if you're just quickly looking well, at it, not for uh, detail. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, the... So then I immediately started flipping through, and he was like, I'm sorry, I take it back. Like, don't, don't <laughs> it's really good, that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, and then I was like, especially for the 80s, like, there's a lot of points where it looks a lot more like uh, the modern uh, comic style we get. Like, if you look at, compared to, the main thing I think of is some of the Silver Surfer comic stuff, uh, Secret Wars. It's, those are a mm. lot oh, yeah. flatter, awesome. a lot more color. It mm -hmm. sometimes doesn't feel like it meshes right, but which is all still good. That's just the style that it was at the time. And this was very different from mm -hmm. those others. Yeah. So what is it about, what, what was it about this that was so compelling to you that you're like, so the, you saw the film, mm -hmm. and then you wanted to read this with me as part of our survey of eschatological apocalyptic works. What was it about this? That... Yes. So uh, what I had remembered about the film was well, the two major things being this world is collapsing on itself, which I was like, the idea of an apocalypse. It's mm -hmm. they're they're coming to an end. Is that a problem? Let's just talk a little bit louder. <laughs> <laughs> it should be fine. It should be fine. The <laughs> we just recognize that the uh, the microphone is not plugged into anything. I was asking you like what was so compelling about you saw the film and you know, what was it about the film that captivated you mm -hmm. and that you make, and, and also why do you think of it as, because when I saw the film, I didn't think about it as a film about apocalypticism. Yeah. I'm seeing that in the, in the novel more. Mm -hmm. it, it definitely is heavier in the novel mm -hmm. and, but still, and it, you know, you don't, it's not like all other stories where you're actually watching people through the apocalypse whatever that version of it is it's more of all build up to you know when it starts that's true and uh so that's one thing that grabbed at me and then the other thing that we talked about which we'll go in with him in uh, deeper detail is the way that dr manhattan is portrayed as a god instead of a oh. superhero well a man powered with they they think they literally call him it. <laughs> but, they call him God. Yeah, yeah. but is uh, he um he is the only super powered character in the book, isn't he? Mm -hmm. So he's the only real superpower. The rest of them are costumed adventurers. Yeah. So everyone else is just dudes well, like, in costumes that either just use their fists, use mm -hmm. guns, or Night Owl has a. He's Night Owl's Batman. He just has a plethora mm -hmm. of gadgets that he uses. And well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the film, wasn't Osmodeus also superpowered? Or am I remembering that? Osmodeus? I didn't I don't think so. Yeah, he's got but like his he has uh, He had a really high IQ. But yeah. she still does in this. He was yeah. really, he's really smart. So it's almost a superhuman intellect, but mm -hmm. not really um yeah. N nothing supernatural or alien or you know we don't have anyone flying or 
Yeah, it truly using is. mental telepathy to talk to Dolphin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it truly is just Dr. Manhattan who has power. Yeah. So that changes the dynamic for sure. Because you have... It'd be like if the just you know the Justice League is you have Batman as the odd man out because mm -hmm. he's the only one who doesn't have powers, and then uh, this would be like the reverse. Yeah, where if Superman was the only one mm -hmm. that you had, right? Yeah. Which I mean, and that I, that's a good point because equally, you know, the whole time we're seeing Doctor Manhattan feel less and less human until he breaks away and goes to Mars. Mm -hmm. And last time I talked about uh, how they showed that through when going through time, he starts with a full clothed outfit. He wears yep. all black. And then the next time we see him, it's the same outfit without sleeves. Then it's a unitard. Then it's just his undies until he just doesn't acknowledge that clothes are a thing. Yeah. He is beyond. He has transcended clothing, <laughs> <laughs> but you still see his blue dong. So it's like, yeah. it's like so. It, but I think part of that also is he just doesn't care about anybody, mm -hmm. like society. So he doesn't care about you know how other people are going to feel yeah. seeing him naked. Mm -hmm. So well, in some ways, it's a little bit like the comedian. He's not as brash and mm -hmm. you know, but. He, he's just as, I don't know how to put it, narcissistic. Anyway. Yeah. That's true. Well, and I will add, they do it in, a, like, what they're trying to portray comes across. Like, it's not gross when they show talking no. about how and out there. Like, they do it in a very tasteful way for what they're trying to tell. There's nothing really X-rated in this graphic novel. Rated R. But, yeah, yeah, and on, probably for the language more than anything. Like yeah. it doesn't, it's not as violent as I expected, and like you said, there's nothing rated X in here. And I thought there'd be a little bit more of that. Were you hoping? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> yeah. no, no. It really is. I like as far as um, so my problems with the graphic novel have nothing to do with the immorality in it. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not pornographic. It's not, um, you know, some people might argue that I, I don't find it pornographic. I don't find, I don't have any problem with the language. I think that's a, a reflection of society. I don't have any problem um, with the violence in it. I think it's, um, it, it is not, this, the violence isn't there. You're not supposed to get like, giggles at people suffering in here so it's not a gratuitous in that way so yeah that, none, that, none of that is, is my problem with the novel I have other problems with it um, but still I like this really how old were you when you saw the film when I first saw the film maybe around 13 okay and you loved it. I liked it a lot. What did you like about it when so, you were 13? Like, I'm, this is what, so there's a little bit of nostalgia here too, I'm guessing. Yes, but um, I, the main intrigue it had for me... 13 is a formative age, mm -hmm. by the way. Like, I can remember, especially, I'm all, used to me, I drive my wife crazy. She said, everything happened to you when you were 12. <laughs> right. <laughs> So. Could you remember everything about it? <laughs> yeah, I would tell all these stories. When I was 12, <laughs> anyway. Yeah, so, so, well, the big thing to me was back then, you know, we didn't have much of the MCU yet, but we still had Marvel movies prior MCU. Mm -hmm. There were still other DC films that weren't this. Uh, actually, there was the, that movie came out the year after... Uh, the Dark Knight and the first Iron Man. But yeah, I saw okay. it in 2013, so I had more under that because 2012 was the Avengers. But so then what gave me intrigue when I saw this was all of those, yes, some of those are totally different than others, but it's still superhero. My goal is to protect society and do no matter 
what I can to ensure that I can help the little guy who can't help himself mm -hmm. and I'm gonna save the day and things are happy in the end and mm -hmm. you know it's that generic <clears throat> superhero story and then I got my dad was like you gotta see this and then okay I, your dad liked it and so I then know. I watched it and it was well this this isn't your normal superhero story. Okay, that's for sure. This is, and that, uh, it's, I think that's why now, not just me, but a lot of people are now like you know, The Boys and Invincible, and we're getting dark stories of mm -hmm. the superhero now. And some of that's, I think. Which you wouldn't have gotten without this, probably. Yeah, like, yeah, you definitely wouldn't have got those without this as a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. But, um, well, equally, that's why I feel like the film definitely would have done better if it came out today. Because, like I said, then you didn't have the superhero genre as blown up as it is. Now, you know, everybody watches the Marvel movies. Not just who's considered the nerds or the oh, comic wow. fans. Everyone is in the superhero genre now. Okay. So then a lot of people, I think a lot of people are getting a burnout on the those uh, more generic, lighthearted superhero saves the day stories. And they, I think that's what's, you know, launched things like The Boys or Invincible, where it's this, superheroes are jerks and bad people. Let's go get them. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. you're, it's just a different perspective. On yeah. Mo most of the, her the the heroes, the costumed adventurers, I mean, they're not really very likable. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's one of my problems with it, is I don't think it, it reflects, like, if you have a circle of, of individuals like this, um, you're going to have at least a few people who are more well-balanced and, like, genuinely likable. <laughs> And not have yeah. everyone completely <laughs> messed up. Yeah, no, everyone is. Every yeah, and um, so the the main thing is there. There this this novel is devoid of hope. There is maybe you disagree with me. I it's drained of it. There's just um, even like people that maybe you think have a reason to hope, or you know they have a are. are fighting for but it, it all you know nothing works out in the end there's no it's all yeah it all comes to naught i'm gonna find the passage okay. yeah okay so we got this character named rorschach who which he says none of the characters are likable i'm gonna be honest i like rorschach <laughs> oh he's a fascist and uh he's don't like when you outright say that then it makes me look love <laughs> love me Every character in this book Austin is loves. flawed. <laughs> Every character in this book has problems. But that's equally, that's everyone. Everyone is flawed. Everyone has problems. Well, his problem is he's a fascist. But, but he, had, he had a troubled past. He comes by it honestly. <laughs> Let me tell you the reasons that I like Korshak. Okay. One, I, he's, awesome. to me he's badass. The, the, literally, okay. the costume, the concept. Oh, yeah. oh no, no, I, I'll literally. give you that. Yeah, no, his he's he is um, he's by far the most interesting character. Yeah, and then hands down, equally, uh, there's a whole section here where we get his whole backstory, and I think we said it was uh, book six is when they do that, but it's dark, dark, very dark backstory. So then you get why he's so fucked up yeah, <laughs> is, is. is because of that past but then yet i argue he's the one glimpse of hope yes he's a fascist that's not okay. good yes he's violent <laughs> that's not good but he's the only costumed vigilante who's still trying to figure out what's going on and try and save the day in a sense in the end everyone so let me they passed a law similar to you know, the X-Men's Registration Act or the Civil War Superhuman Registration Act that Marvel did, right? Where superheroes are no longer allowed to be mm -hmm. superheroes. The only ones allowed 
are ones working for the government. So the only active heroes left were Dr. Manhattan and the comedian. And everyone else willingly said, okay, and hung up their cape. Rorschach said, no, I'm going to keep fighting crime and protecting people. It does raise a question like, so comic books are great in comic books, but this is like this whole idea that what if people really did this? Yeah. Would we be that's... okay with that? I don't know. <laughs> anyway. But yeah. So that that is a lot to unpack. You make a good point. And, and I think that's part of the, the whole rationale of the story mm -hmm. is what does it mean if you you know, give this group of like private citizens mm -hmm. and you're like expecting them to you know establish yeah. order and justice in society. I don't anyway. All right, I'll read the glimpse of hope section. Okay. Rorschach opens anytime it like we're following his story. It opens with him narrating, and it's he's writing. This is from his diary, right? Yeah. And he's he's trying to um, he's investigating the murder of the comedian. Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, this is a murder mystery mm -hmm. because <clears throat> the, and he suspects that someone's out to get all of the. Uh, Superheroes, the masked or, heroes. Is that masked hero. Yeah, yeah, he keeps saying the masks uh -huh. because yeah. uh, the comedian gets killed, and then later, you know, Doctor Manhattan goes to Mars. Mm -hmm. Someone tries to kill uh, Adrian Babe. Yeah, who is as uh, uh, Osman uh, dies, and then uh, you know, so it's clear that it seems like there's a hit out on all of these people, mm -hmm. and well, and then. He gets framed and then ends up going to jail. Which, I mean, yes, he deserved to go to jail to begin with, but he was framed when he was trying to investigate and solve right. this, and now he can't because he got put yeah. behind bars. Mm -hmm. But, so, Rorschach's Journal, October 16th, 1985, 42nd Street. Women's breasts draped across every billboard, every display littering the sidewalk. But by the way, <clears throat> Rorschach has a hang up with sex because mm -hmm. of formative things that happened with his mother, so. Was offered Swedish love and French love, but not American love. American love like Coke and green glass bottles. They don't make it anymore. <laughs> Thought about Moloch's story on way to cemetery. Could all be lies. Could all be part of a revenge scheme planned during his decade behind bars. But if true, then what? Puzzling reference to an island, also to Dr. Manhattan. Might he be at risk in some way? So many questions. Never mind answers. Soon, nothing is insoluble. Nothing is hopeless. Not while there's life. Right. So you have that. But on the other hand, when he is in prison, you have the whole chapter with the, the psychologist who is analyzing him, hoping to, like, actually profit from um, helping him yeah. and like build a reputation and and this chapter um, is it's called the abyss stares back right the abyss gazes mm -hmm. also and uh, and it ends with every chapter ends with a quote from some thinker or, uh, one of them ends with a, a quote from the book of Job this one comes from Nietzsche who is the, um, at least the godfather of nihilism. He's, he may be not a nihilist himself, I and mean, that's debatable, I think he kind of is, but uh, certainly nihilists, you don't get nihilism as a philosophical school of thought without Nietzsche. And uh, he says, battle not with monsters, lest you become a monster. And if you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gazes also into you. Which, this whole chapter is about how he drives the psychologist who's trying to help him crazy. <laughs> he winds up being just as messed up as Rorschach by the end. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. it, it, Not even necessarily crazy, but devoid of anything. Like, he's just... Yeah. Well, like Rorschach, he's... Um, he, his a view of the world has been transformed by exposure to mm -hmm. the the terrible things happening in it, 
and so he's become like another little Rorschach. I mean, he's literally in the last frame looking at the ink blots, that the Rorschach blots mm -hmm. that he was putting on in front of Rorschach to interpret. He's looking at them and interpreting them himself. But I think that the whole thing there is Rorschach is the the abyss. And he was and staring at it. Yeah, I don't know. That's mm -hmm. that's my take on it. Yeah. And well, it also, it, it's a little meta because, you know, he's just... This chapter is so... I mean, it's awful. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a little bit like, okay, did that? Did I just do that to you when you read this? Mm -hmm. is, is what happened to the psychologist happened to you that you... Yeah. I It messes with you a little bit. Mm -hmm. I don't well, know. Cause we talked about how, in a sense, this whole book is the abyss. Yeah. Looking back at you. I because so. well, a big thing that happens is through all the horrible things that go on in here, you overall don't feel much emotion for for any of it you're yeah. just no which is like goes back to like wow that's <laughs> did it really make me not care <laughs> for a book that is full of i don't know hundreds of tragedies mm -hmm. i think it is remarkably um emotionless there's very little sadness uh, conveyed yeah. in the tragedy. It, it's mostly just, I don't know, this really sucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this kind of, and um, I don't know. So again, I don't have a problem with um, with art. You know, I love, as I get older, something weird is happening to uh -huh. me. I find, I really love sad songs. Um, I love sad stories. I love Shakespeare's tragedies mm -hmm. more than his comedies. It wasn't like that just a few years ago, but I don't know why, what it is. It's not because I'm more sad, but I, there's something about um, the way those pieces of art um, touch me. It feels like it's more authentic, and it, 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 and it um, you know, the catharsis that Aristotle talks about mm -hmm. happens on a deeper level with that. I still love mm -hmm. comedy and, you know. But, but the way, the reason, let's like, okay, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet is the work of art that it is, is because you think it's a comedy. You, you, the, you know, mm -hmm. and you see how this could work out. And so it just crushes you in the end because it pulls the rug out from you. This, there's no rug here to pull out from under you. Because from the very beginning, it is bleak. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you see what I mean? So you like those because they make you sad. Yeah. And then this That's one the point of doesn't it. make you attached. So you find it hard to get sad. Yeah, and I don't think he's, he wants you to feel sad. I don't... I, well, I don't yeah, I don't think he does either. Yeah. I think it's... Uh, he wants you to just feel like this is the way things are. Yeah, I think so. Which is, I don't know. I, it, it's a little weird to me that it is, it is as popular as it is. So, I, I don't know if it's just because of what a great, like, technically. I don't know if I'm going to say it's a great piece of art. Um, but as far as on a technical level, yes. It is. It's amazing. I think it could be that combined with this is the first, like, Completely different, like maybe dark superhero just story, like for ground oh, And then, as well, there's people out there that are probably like, Yeah, this world is shitty. Yeah, that's what my daughter said. Yeah, <laughs> not exactly like that, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that has a mouth like a sailor. Yeah, no. no. she gets it from you. Yeah, that's funny. right, anyway. Um, the last thing we should talk about, because I think we're kind of running yeah, out. We should time. jump to Dr. Manhattan real quick. Yeah, well, yeah, and I've been thinking about it ever since last Thursday when I was talking about this. And I think the best way to talk about this is that there are a lot of little microaggressions against Christianity in here, I think. You so, pointed out a few, but are you thinking there's more than we even realize? I think the whole thing is, a, is like just a collection of microaggressions um, in, a, in a way. I, I don't know if he's even aware of it. Uh, um, so, but, but um, it, you know, in the 80s, it was kind of um, popular to, you know, eh, let's be honest, 
uh, the church had it coming. You know, we, but um, it became a kind of trope. Mm -hmm. the, think about Footloose, right? Like, so the whole idea of like, you know, um, Christians are these you know, self-righteous, bigoted, hypocritical, you know, and, and, um, and their world, and in the 80s, Christianity um, in the West at least still had a lot of purchase in society. Mm -hmm. That doesn't have today, I would say. Um, and so it feels like there's a lot of a kind of, I mean, it was a trope. It, this isn't the only thing. Um, but a lot of this is depicting Christianity in a poor light whenever it can. Um, so, for instance, like just a little thing. When he uh, mentions the Bible, he doesn't capitalize it. That's, that's a little mm -hmm. thing. But, but um, with Dr. Manhattan, okay, um, this is really interesting to me. Yeah. There's a lot to unbox with him. I was, one of the main sure. things I liked was you pointed out the whole watchmaker or yeah. watch man to watch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so Doctor Manhattan, uh, John, uh, when he's a kid, he wants to be a watch repairer. Mm -hmm. He wants to be a watchman. Yeah. He likes the yeah. gears. That's that's what he loves. It's what he wants to do. And his dad comes in and takes the, the watch he's working on and all of its parts and just chucks them out into the yep. street out the window. Yeah. And uh, is like, you got to go into uh, nuclear science. That's where the world's moving. You need to be a physicist. And so this whole thing, you know, in sometimes God, this is more of a deistic concept than a theistic concept. But sometimes God is referred to as the watchmaker. Okay. And so I think that that's not an accident here, mm -hmm. that here we have... Um, another god um, and there's this little another one of these little prose sections at the end of one of the chapters at the end of chapter six and a four excuse me chapter four um, this is supposedly somebody has written a book about dr. Manhattan called superpowers and the superpowers and uh, they're talking about his origin story, where mm -hmm. he's caught in this little device, this uh, nuclear device. And, um, and he says, on the news flashes coming over our TVs on that fateful night, one sentence was repeated over and over again, the Superman exists and he's American. I never said that, although I do recall saying something similar to a persistent reporter who would not leave without a quote. I presume the remark was edited or toned down so as not to offend public sensibilities. In any event, I never said the Superman exists and he's American. What I said was, God exists and he's American. If that statement starts to chill you after a couple of moments' consideration, then don't be alarmed. A feeling of intense and crushing religious terror at the concept indicates only that you are still sane. So, in a way... Basically, what I think Alan Moore is doing here is imagining what would it be like if, you know, God isn't just this transcendent being, but he was actually an American. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Moore, this is something I keep thinking about, too, is Moore is British. We're right. actually and doing British is, literature sure. here, but yeah. anyway. And it's all about American He knows American society. culture really well. So. Um but so what if God was American? And, and then what this becomes in a weird sort of way is the inverse of a theodicy. So a theodicy is where you're trying to justify God's ways to man, uh, the way Par um, Milton does in Paradise Lost. Here he's, by, uh, by picturing God as one of us, then he, you can start to lob all these accusations against him. Mm -hmm. This is what I mean by microaggressions. Yeah. So he's, a, he's kind of a proxy for God. Uh, so for instance, so I mean, and, and his whole idea is like, God is so far and remote, and like if there is a God, he doesn't give a shit about us. That's kind of the message of this. Well, yeah, because we go from him being essentially a government soldier and researcher to 
goodbye, and he leaves to Mars. Yeah, yeah, and and then um, in later in chapter, I think it's chapter ten, no, chapter nine. Uh, there's a long uh, debate between him and his girlfriend. God has a girlfriend named Lori about the future of the Earth, and he's like, hey, you know, on a cosmic scale, it just doesn't matter if all humanity is wiped out, and. And it's kind of like this sort of thing, uh, you know, it's kind of that sense of cosmic dread that you get when you look out at the stars at night and you're like, and you say with the psalmist in uh, Psalm 8, what is man that thou art mindful of him, right? But the rest of the psalm tells us that it doesn't make a lick of sense, but God is mindful of us. He's made us a little lower than the angels and he's put everything in our care. This is not that God. He, he really doesn't give a shit. Yeah. And well, and then we equally see that because you, you brought up his first girlfriend. And I yeah. say first because then, sure, since he doesn't age, he decides, I want, I want someone younger. Mm-hmm. And just leaves his first girlfriend, who ironically uh, ended up being the reason he transformed because he wanted to fix her watch. Because he still cared about that right. when he the was first little, girlfriend, yes. and left that watch in whatever the fictional nuclear box was that turned him into, yeah, Doctor Manhattan. Yeah. So the whole. So we have like this incarnate version of God. He, in some ways, he's a little bit eternal. Like time isn't. He's not experiencing time the way we do. Mm-hmm. He can be in more than one place. So there's like this hint of omnipresence about him. This hint of um, omnipotence about him. He can do whatever he wants. He can create matter. Uh, anything. Yeah. yeah. Anything. Well, that's the end of uh, that chapter where he's on Mars. We see he's what looks like based off of watch gears. He just starts pulling things out yep. of the ground. Yeah. So he, but, he really is the watchmaker. Mm-hmm. And um, oh, the other thing is, he can, he knows the future. He's we said on mm-hmm. yeah we said he's on the content. He literally, at one point, he's talking to his first girlfriend, and he's like, "I know you're mad right now. I know we're gonna fight, but in two point five minutes, someone's gonna come to the door with new earrings that I bought you, and you're going to get very emotional, and then we're going to make love." Like he's just, and then she's like, "Why are you doing this?" Why? And then. It happens, she forgives him, yeah. he gets the earrings, and then the same time we're getting within his eternal monologue, he was like, as I held her, I knew that years later I'd be holding someone else. Yeah. And then I still looked at her and said, I will love you forever. Like, So he can lie, too. Yeah. He's, um, the, so at the end of, I think it's chapter three, uh, you have him sitting alone on, on Mars, and at the bottom it says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right, quoting uh, Genesis chapter 18, which is where Abraham is plotting, uh, he's pleading, excuse me, uh, for God to not overthrow Sodom and Gomorrah. So there's a similar, mm-hmm. like, kind of apocalyptic yeah. scenario there. Yeah. Well, I'm, this chapter is the, that chapter is the one where he goes to Mars, and then since America's protector is gone... Russia suddenly gears up, starts mm-hmm. name, aiming all of their nuclear missiles, and the we see like a war room where America's freaking out, and because they're like World War Three is about to happen. So then the last line of that book is from the probably yeah. presumably the general or whoever, and he goes, "After that, humanity is in the hands of a higher authority than mine. Let's just hope he's on our side." Obviously, he's thinking about the God of the Bible, mm-hmm. but. That frame shows Manhattan's yeah. blue fingers holding this photo of him and his old girlfriend, and he's so it's yeah mm-hmm. it's it's paralleling it's <laughs> what they do right and and yeah that I I that this from a theological standpoint it doesn't work for me I feel <laughs> like it, it's um you know it it, it doesn't feel uh, honestly it doesn't feel that clever really. yeah it's just like kind of kind of a cheap shot in Christianity to mm-hmm. be honest um, I, I don't yeah the um, it's also he is bound to fate and there's some things he doesn't know 
uh, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's it's weird. I'm still trying to wrap my head around whoa, how much she knows about the future or not, or what Alan Moore was trying to portray with that his ability of his. It, it doesn't work for me necessarily. Like mm -hmm. he says, well, maybe if there was some kind of atomic um, event that might interfere with my perception of the future. I don't know. But he's also, like, there's a sort of, he can't make decisions, he yeah. says. He's, he has to, even though he knows what's going to happen, he can't change his response. So he is um, just as much a slave to fate as everyone else. Mm -hmm. So this is extremely deterministic. When I saw the film, uh, I can remember giving, uh, well, Doc, Doc, uh, Brian Dietrich loves this. And I just thought, well, this is like pure Baptist church, right? You're, this is all Calvinism. Because it's like, this is all like laid out and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. And, and you're stuck in this. You're all sinners and, and you're all going to go to hell. <laughs> and yeah, and there's nothing you can do about it. Mm. Not even God can do anything about it. Yes. Yeah. And so, it, to me it's ironic because it's like, okay, what would it be like if God became one of us. And the thing is, we already have a book that does that. <laughs> and, and, and it doesn't look like this. No. <laughs> uh, Jesus is, so for him, Dr. Manhattan, the more he becomes like God, the more he is unhuman, mm -hmm. inhuman, in, in, inhumane. But Jesus, who we say is 100% God and 100% man, his divinity does not interfere with his humanity. Yeah. In fact, weirdly, it makes him more human, I would say. Mm -hmm. No, I agree with that. And, um, and so that, that's where it fails for me, is that mm -hmm. um, Jesus is not distant from us. He's not uncaring. God is not uncaring mm -hmm. because he sends Jesus to be one of us. And this is a grand mystery because on a, on a certain level, yeah, like he's saying... What do we account for in the cosmic sweep of things? Well, we must account for a great deal because God became part of our family. Um, and, and God is not... So, so really, he, he winds up looking more like one of the pagan deities in some way. Like, yeah. It's a lot like Zeus. Mm -hmm. um, I've one, one of the spots that I think you see the most where he acts like he cares but he doesn't is mm -hmm. uh in vietnam when him and the comedian yep. are in vietnam That's a great example. and uh the comedian ended up getting one of the vietnamese women pregnant and she confronts him and says you need to stay we're gonna have to raise a family like you can't abandon me and he's like no forget all that i'm going back to the americas and i'm getting wasted and living my life as a slut mm -hmm. and uh when she refuses, he just pulls his gun, and then at first we see Doctor Manhattan. But she attacks him with the bottle. Like oh yeah, she she attacks us first. Which, yeah. but honestly, in that moment, you're like, go her. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, Doctor Manhattan turns, and you know he go when comedian pulls his gun, and he says, no, don't do it, no, and then he does it anyway, and then he looks at Doctor Manhattan. And kind of shrugs at him like, yeah. you didn't actually care. And then he, look, the comedian literally breaks it down to him and says, you could have teleported me, you could have teleported her, you yeah. could have turned my gun into steam and it just evaporated midair, and you didn't do a damn thing to try and save this woman. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a certain take on God. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people feel that way about God. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. The, and I felt like that towards God mm -hmm. in my own life um, at certain times. But uh, this is like, the only answer for that kind of suffering is, is the cross. There's no good answer for why God allows bad things to happen to good people. Um, but there is the consolation that God didn't abandon us to suffer on our own. That he came and suffered with us. You don't get that with Dr. Manhattan. Yeah. Do we need to wrap it up? Yeah. I mean, oh, man, it's about... <laughs> we, should, we should probably go ahead and wrap it yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I mean, I will say that 
I'm, I, th I mean, to me, I think, you know, we're supposed to suffer and equally that helps us learn yeah. and become who we need to be. Because equally, if, if there was no suffering, we'd already be in paradise. True, and, and also, I mean, weirdly, suffering, you, you can get this twisted, mm -hmm. but, but suffering makes, it enriches life. Yeah. No, so, I 100% agree with that. Yeah. I, that's why I like sad songs mm -hmm. and tragedies. Um, life is better because we feel that we, we experience those sorrows. Yeah. Um, well, then it makes us appreciate what we have mm -hmm. even more. Right. Yeah, but it, it, it's really all about love. Because um, to really know what what love is, you have you have to suffer. I think. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, this is good. This is where we just went into a little talk. A little talk <laughs> that the world, yeah. you know, some one of the world needed to hear. I hope so. Look at that. Look at that come around. And I thought about making a comment about Zack Snyder's Man of Steel. That was way better. This was okay. way better. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that next time. Yeah. Well, well I haven't seen Man of Steel. So. Well, I was going to say that for how much uh, this book, uh, you can makes clear connections to Christianity. Uh, I've heard this. It's interesting that since he did both Man of Steel and Watchmen, like in the movie, I need to rewatch Watchmen because maybe he does it more than I realize. Mm -hmm. Because again, I, I don't remember. 13, I don't but, remember watching it thinking, "Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Doctor Manhattan is yeah. God." But in Man of Steel, he does it a lot more directly. I've heard this, and uh, you know, it's like compares Superman to Jesus as the Savior mm -hmm. that came to Earth. Which it, it's interesting how he does it as well because he also shows Superman as a Christian. Interesting. That is interesting. But so I think it's more of, you know, he was trying to make a parallel to that idea of the Christ story, which is, I'm pretty sure, no, I won't say that because it was done by, never mind, I won't say that part because that's not true. I about said it in factual. So, okay. but I, I'm pre he's making that correlation, I don't think as a jab, but to just. That's what I've heard. Yeah. Re, you know, that. And told me that, that idea yeah. of that he's he's here to be a savior, but then uh, equally, like I said, he also portrays him as a Christian. And when it comes down to it, when he's got to make the big decision, he he goes to the cathedral. And he's like, Father, I don't know what to do. Okay, and I have to see Man of Steel. You do. It's a wonderful film, and probably. One of my favorite things, of, it's that film opens first probably 20 minutes of that film on Krypton. That's what I've heard too. Before yeah. uh, he's even launched to Earth. Aren't there weird like Krypton dragons? Yeah, they look cool though. It's, you <laughs> see the battle for Krypton as it's yeah. literally imploding on itself. Okay. As a, that's, they suffered an apocalypse and lost over there. That's the reason to look at it. We, we should look at and talk about the first 20 minutes of Man of Steel. Man of Steel. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Austin. Yeah, this thank you. This was good. Sorry we had to do it all again, but I think we discovered a lot. I think so, too. Oh, it's raining.